Hey everyone, it's Peter Kerr from Rock Day Dream Nation and I've got my friend from Scotland, Davey Gallagher, back in the seat. How are you going, Davey? Very well, thank you. How are you, Peter? Not too bad, not too bad at all. Today we're going to do a show contrasting two albums from the same band but very different sonically and by lineup. We're going to cover 1977 Ultravox Ha Ha Ha, apostrophe marks all the way through. And we're also going to compare this against the 1980 commercial juggernaut of Ultravox Vienna. So what we're going to do is both of us are going to just spotlight three or four songs from each album. And at the end of the show, we'll basically give our summation of what our preferred album is. So, Davey, maybe um, we might start off this conversation by what was your first impression of Ultravox or first encounter with Ultravox as a band? Um, I mean, being from the UK, I just don't remember not knowing Ultravox. Um, I know from discussions with people online, even pretty big American pop fans, pop and rock fans, don't know Ultravox terribly well at all. Um, maybe they know a couple of things, but it's very, very scatty. Um, yeah. So I, I was really surprised at that, because even if you only know the massive hits, you know, Dancing with Tears in Her Eyes, you know, the, that kind of thing, or even mid years solo hits like If I Was and that kind of stuff, or his involvement with Live Aids and writing, Do They Know It's Christmas? Um, but most people seem to know him in our community is that guy that was in Thin Lizzy for a little bit, or, you know, you know that's his legacy for a lot yeah. of people in our, our kind of crowd. Whereas mid year to me is a titan of music, an absolute titan. Um, and then years later, um, I went back and investigated the John Fox era because you ain't hearing that on the radio. Um, but yeah, so it is a battle of two bands and how fascinating that it's all within a couple of years, though. It just shows you how quickly music changed back in. Back in it, day, but uh, yeah, absolutely. Well, I guess my first encounter with Ultravox was um, in the early '80s with the Vienna album because it was just played on radio, played on all the music stations, the video hits uh, shows on TV, and um, you couldn't avoid um, Ultravox and Vienna because it was all part of that new romantic um, synth pop yeah. which ruled the roost in the early '80s. In respect to John Fox. Not so much, other than reading articles and doing a deep dive on artists like Gary Newman um, and Visage and seeing that a lot of their influences was by a certain guy called John Fox. Mm -hmm. And um, I think John Fox did a tour of um, a solo tour of Australia 10 years ago. I unfortunately missed it. I kind of regret it. So I got into the Ultravox, the early albums much later, and um, I kind of sort of uh, regret that I should have got into it a lot earlier because it's fantastic. Mm. It is really, but two completely different bands. So, mm -hmm. all right. So what we'll do, we'll talk about Ha Ha Ha, which came out in 1977. So just a little bit of background. Um, the band itself is John Fox on vocals, Steve Shear on guitars, Billy Curry on violas, synth and keyboards, Chris Cross on bass and vocals, and Warren Cairn on drums. Now you've got the nucleus of, Ultra box for the the um, yep. the major era, but we'll talk about yep. the subtle changes. Now, this album was um, produced by legendary Stephen Lillywhite, who mm -hmm. everyone knows from XTC, Simple Minds, Susie and the Banshee, Psychedelic Furs. He was like the who's who of the um, synth pop new wave. You too, producing. obviously. Yep. Absolutely. So um, maybe start off with, um, yeah, choose a song. Um Put a, a spotlight yeah. on one song and we'll, we'll go from there. So you yes, asked, first of all, before we start with Peter, did I have a physical copy to hand because uh, because you couldn't locate yours on your shelves and we've all been there. And then, then the next time you look, it'll be staring right at you. Um, I ordered from Discogs about two years ago. I ordered a copy of the, um, the limited edition uh, Japanese sleeve ones that they were selling. And the cell listed this as very good. This is how it turned up. I'm going to hold this up. Now, can you see that all across the top there? Oh. It's just complete. Right? And then this is supposed to be LP, remember? So it should just slide yeah. out the side. It opens up like that because it's so badly. Look, that is 
that is very good condition. And it's the CD is covered in muck and filth. Oh. Um, he said, uh, well, it must have been damaged in transit. I said, what transit? The Titanic, for goodness sake. So, uh, yes, I don't really have a CD of this album either anymore. Um, yeah. So, yeah. Um, Sorry to so, hear. Yeah. It, you're well, not I the only it, one who's gone through that, that sort of experience. I've actually had a CD that's been crushed must have been in the pressing machine and the CD was actually had a big chunk out of it. So yeah, uh, it's I mean, frustrating the, when that happens. The nonsense thing was the envelope was fine. The Jiffy bag was okay. So, you know, it was at it. It was, it was just at it. Yeah. Anyway, um, so I, I keep that as a reminder to myself um, never to trust <laughs> in Discogs too much. Um, but yeah, to pick a couple of tracks, um, I mean, overall, really, you could, you could just discuss the fact that this album is almost ahead of its time. It's post-punk before punk's even finished, isn't it? Um, John mm. Fox is doing this literate thing where post-punk would take uh, things a few years later, but, you know, we're still in the middle of punk. I mean, these tracks were cut in 76, going into 77, and it was their second album in, in uh, about nine months. Um, I mean, I'll, I'll cut to the chase here. Um, my favourite song on this album and one of my favourite Ultra, so uh, Ultra Socks, uh, that's, uh, <clears throat> that's for the Boston Red Sox uh, super group, mm -hmm. um, is the, um, the man who does every day. I love that song yeah. to bits. I absolutely adore it. I think it's one of the most literate songs. It's got a brilliant story. It's like a film noir um, that's that's set to this bass heavy electronic um, kind of monotone delivery, which again is very post punk from from John on the on the vocals. Um, very um, very punky attitude with a post punk delivery, and and that's something that nobody else is really doing. So I wonder if that is uh, if this exact same album would come out a little bit later. I wonder if that that had had have uh, changed the course of history for Ultravox because they they just seem a little bit too yeah. ahead of themselves, you know? It's like yeah. they're, they're deconstructing a genre before the genre has had a chance to really launch itself yet. Look, I, I agree with you. That was one of my picks, so I'll do my um, spin on it. I think this is the blueprint for Gary Newman, this song. And mm. Gary Newman has actually said that um, if it wasn't for John Fox, I wouldn't have um, got started. He is my yeah. main, one of my main influences. I love the viola of oh, Bill, Bill yeah. uh, Billy Curry. It's actually, mm -hmm. I love his sweeping by, viola all the way through mm -hmm. the catalogue. And we'll talk more about Vienna because it's all yes. over that album in spades. Yeah. But um, it's got a really um, harsh bass line, uh, crisscross, mm -hmm. not not the crisscross, but yeah. the crisscross, um, yeah. harsh bass line. And um, it's got a really alien, disconnected feel to it. And, um, look, I'm sorry, John Fox was definitely the blueprint for um, um, Simon Le Bon. I, mean, I was listening to this album mm -hmm. and watching it live, and I'm thinking, because I always had this theory that one of the main um, nucleus sort of influences for Duran Duran was Japan. But I'm starting to think it was actually maybe John Fox Ultravox. Yeah, so, yeah. And it makes more sense, kind of being able to see them easily on the scene as well at that point. Yeah. So, yeah, um, that, that makes perfect sense. I mean, spec another one from, from the records, um, just to go through it. Um, I mean, I won't just pick my favourites because I think it's better to get a kind of rounded view yeah. of it. Yeah. Um, artificial Life. Um, I think that is where we can hear that you, John, although he's influencing others, is doing a very David Bowie um, or Ian Hunter kind of vocal on it here. I, I was almost expecting all the young dudes to come in at certain points um, first time I heard this. Um, it's it's got a great riff, um, and it's perhaps the only, the first song I can I can think of that mentions Scientology. I can't think of a song earlier than this that this is Scientology um, as a fad in 1977. That's quite incredible. Um, it's time, yeah. Yeah, again, it's roughly ahead of its time. Um, offbeat guitar, you know, not really caring if it's if the rhythm's in, in sync or anything. It's just kind of doing that, again, very post-punk scratchy thing, that, that very scratchy guitar sound, chicken scratch, um, which, again, wouldn't come along until two or three years later. It's, it really is like they have, they have made the perfect album for the wrong time. <laughs> 
Um, yeah. This one in particular. Oh. So, yeah. yeah. Well, I think this album, it, it doesn't really sort of get talked about a lot um, when people no. talk about in the post-punk discussion. Um, everyone talks about uh, Gang of Four and all the obvious mm. um, major suspects, but they don't really talk about Ultravox as much. But um, that, that song's a perfect example. I'll pick yeah. a song which is a little bit uh, kind of going through that offbeat, and it's While I'm Still Alive. Mm. It's got this really discord, wacky guitar line, um, and then you've got this choppy piano line. So it, there's this counterpoint between the guitar and the piano. And um, Fox is actually doing a little bit of a John Linden type vocal. It's kind of sneering mm. a little bit sort of um, anti-authority. Um, mm -hmm. And you look at the lyrics and the lyrics go, stagger and swagger, combing my hair. If tomorrow's not there, then at least today's all mine. And I, I wrote down, this is like a punk version of John Favrolta walking down in Saturday Night Fever. So it's like <laughs> the punk strutting down the street and going, this is this is. This is who I am. So, yeah, I think it's got a lot of attitude, that song. I love it. Yeah, yeah, it's, that, that is a cool one. Um, it's, and it's got a real rock and roll purity to it as well. So I think I think they've been able to combine that um, slightly more avant-garde post-punk thing with a rock and roll purity that still comes from punk. Um, I mean, my third pick from the, this album then would be um, another track that seems completely ahead of its time um, because to me it sounds like what Bowie would go on to do in Berlin um, but this is before Berlin um, the, the era because um, they recorded this before he even went there um, and it's Hiroshima Monomo, um, which uh, I mean again one of the, the cornerstones of post-punk is to be so kind of arty and literate well they're literally making a song named after an Alan Rennie uh, French art house film. Um, and you don't get more, you know, The Clash weren't going to do that, were they? Or um, or the, the Pistols, or insert name here. Um, so they were perfectly happy to do that. Um, it's sung totally differently from the rest of the record, intentionally. You know, it's done as a, it's done as a, a complete vault face from what you've heard before. And it's, it's a really pure and heartfelt um, piece, which you just don't get on this record anywhere else. There's no kind of sincerity. There's a lot of um, nodding and winking in the rest of the record, but this one track at the end is just, what's this? This has come from a different album again entirely. Yes, yes. Yeah. Well, that was one of my picks, and I think this is one of the ones that I actually had a vague familiarity and i think i've heard this song before so whether it's mm -hmm. played on um alternative radio or not um i'm familiar with the origins of the song and i think that's really cool i love how mm -hmm. it starts off with this really um a simple drum machine pattern it's like mm -hmm. nova and then yeah. it, it, this drone like synth line comes in and it just envelops the um the song like a, a mm -hmm. fog and um Beautiful sax line. I, look, I've always got a, I like the sax coming in and um, mm -hmm. they're using these really um, different sort of left field type of instruments and it works. Mm. It works really well. Um, but, uh, yeah, Fox's vocals are really compelling and charismatic and I think it's one of their best songs, to be quite frank, um, in the Fox yeah, and era. It, and it's one of the ones that they would keep for Midge to sing as well because um, on, I can't remember which one of these sets, Rage and Eden yeah. or... Vienna, but one of these sets has got a live concert where Midge does it. Um, and yeah, it's perfect for him too with, with his range. Um, so it was it was the kind of carry over song. They didn't carry too much over. It was one of the situations as soon as they could get a lot out of the set list, they did um, and move on. Um, but yeah, they kept Hiroshima more and more. So. Yeah, and it suits his vocals perfectly. I can imagine Midge yeah. Um, yeah, crooning through that really well. Yeah. Okay, yeah. you got another one. Yeah, let's pick another one then. Um, hmm, um, Fear in the Western World um, to me sounds like the most authentic punk one. If you had to say that this is is not post-punk but just actual punk, this is closest to where the album gets. Yeah. Um, I mean, it sounds like not not like it could have come off the, the Clash debut album, but as close to it as Ultravox would be. Um, mm. You even get the kind of uh, the offbeat harmonies that Mick and Joel would have in the band. Um, they're almost kind of doing the same kind of parts there. Um, there's still a kind of um, 
and I had a solid idea of seeing the, the the world through the eyes of a young man, feel to the whole thing. We end up in a massive wall of distortion, which again does take you away from punk and towards post-punk, because that would be mm. much more signature of, you know, Joy Division, Jesus and Mary Chain, etc. Um, yeah. So yeah, even, even in this track, it verges into post-punk at times, but for the most part, it's the closest this album comes to pure punk, I think. Yeah, that's that's a nice track. Um, yeah, I think the thing that uh, classifies it as post-punk is when it's too much musicianship and they're getting too, yes. way too experimental because punk mm-hmm. attitude is D- DIY, do it yourself. Um, yeah. So, um, yeah, I think you, you've summed that up um, perfectly. My next pick is uh, actually Rock Rock. Um, I think this is a bonkers opening track. Yeah. And it's actually got, I wrote down a Brian Ferry type vocal and to me, mm. I think it is a, a clash between glam and punk because yeah. um, I think John Fox was very influenced by those those cats of the early 70s, your fairies, your, probably your Lou Reeds, your, your Bowies, all the superstars, um, loves the glam, but it's like a clash between glam and punk, and I think it's a yeah, really some, good. A little bit New York Dolls almost. Mm. Yeah, and that kind of presentation of... So it's like a deconstruction of glam rather than yep. doing glam, yeah. Yeah. And again, we're we're practically still in the glam era, you know. I mean, the Hoopler's still going, and um, Mark Boland's still alive, you know. I mean, he's, Bay City he's Rollers not... are still, you know, like at the tail end, aren't they? <laughs> yeah. So they're, they're, so... I'm, I'm talking about the really populous glam, but um... yeah. Um, I mean, Mark Boland's at this point got BBC TV show, and it's more variety. So it, we're definitely mm. the 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 arse end the fag end of of glam yeah. as a as a an interesting entity but it's interesting that <laughs> so soon after it was a viable genre here they are kind of deconstructing it again it's only just finished you know it's like the minute something was done we can take it apart and start again you know yeah. to quote orange juice you know rip it up and start again yeah, but it's really funny that punk was kind of a rebellion against prog rock and what they perceived the dinosaurs, like the Led mm. Zeppelins and all the stadium rockers. But a lot of those punks, they loved glam. So yeah. that was not the genre that they were really rebelling against. And I think they yeah. always tapped into that genre. Yeah, and I, I think um, it's just a nice quote, isn't it, to be able to say that, you know, that killed, you know, punk killed uh, prog and then, you know, grunge killed hair metal, you know, all these things. You think, no, everything's got a shelf life. Everything moves on. Um, mm. Absolutely every scene um, evolves eventually. We're probably now in the only era um, since, what, 2005-ish where you don't really have that so much mm. um, because, every, you know, with the age of streaming, you can just stick to one type of music and your computer will just give you that and nothing else. So you don't need yep. to be exposed to anything outside your comfort zone. Yep. Um, yep. You don't need to – a DJ doesn't need to know anything about music. It's all programmed for them. Absolutely. Um, so, yeah, so we're still, we're still very much in this era here where music's, you know, if you turn around, um, it's changed on you. By the time you turn mm. back, you need to change your hairdo and everything because it's so different. Yeah, um, yeah. And you're right, Johnny Lydon was going about with a sick uh, Pink Floyd T-shirt, you know, a couple of years before saying he hated Pink Floyd. And well, never apparently he wrote a nice letter to Robert Plant and wanted the lyrics to Kashmir. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so, um, I, and and you see, you see Joe Strummer when he was digging graves, he had the long hair and the big sideburns yep. and things. Yeah, I think there's a little bit of theatre in John's world. I love John, yeah. but there's always that little bit of pantomime, that little bit of theatre of like, oh, yeah. I hate it, but secretly, not not so much. Yeah, he's, he's, he's a yeah. Panto is the best word for John. I mean, it, it, they were the monkeys of the punk movement, really. They were put together, which we'll come to, funnily enough, in a minute, won't we? Uh, yeah. With Major. Yeah. Absolutely. Have you got any? Uh, okay, I'll I'll do one more, and then maybe any other notable um, ones that you want to point out. I've got frozen ones. Um, yeah, it starts off let's, as let's, a, let's just share that then. Yeah, yeah that starts off as, as a mysterious, slow, atmospheric piece, and then goes into this uh, punk rocker type. Stevie Shears, you've got to say he was a valuable player in that band because his mm-hmm. guitar lines are just so charged and spiky. Yeah. Um, it's phonetic, full of energy. Um, what do you think of this one? 
Um, I love um, the the finger clicks at the start. And, you know, that's a really fun way to get into. You think we're we going to get do up all of a sudden because I wouldn't put that past John Fox. Um, you know, we're getting some strange ideas, and then you get the lone synth at the start you know it's very almost desolate it's, it's a strange strange way to get into that track and a very cold lonesome vocal from john at the start of it um and for the first minute or two you could think it was the later incarnation of ultravox i think it could it could almost be something in vienna um but then the energy comes in and then you think ah yeah, this is the John Fox era, um, um, where um, it's much more frenetic and we get the, um, I mean, it's an Oceadra's anthem, isn't it? With the whole, um, are we the frozen one? You know, with the up and down, it's very sing-alongy. It's designed for, uh, I don't know, the Hammersmith. You can imagine people being rammed in in their dreams. This is what they're picturing. We'll sell out the Hammersmith and everybody will sing along with this line. And they'll sing up and down. It and, uh, it never quite happened for this version of the band, but you could, you could imagine this is the kind of anthem they were writing with that in mind. Yeah, look, um, folks, there's some fantastic live footage on YouTube of the John Fox brunted um, Ultravox, either whether they're on the top of the pops or even I think might have been the Hammersmith. It's it's really an mm-hmm. eye-opener just to see what a great live band uh, mm-hmm. they were. I'd love to be in a time machine and see them, um, Yeah, Davey. Fantastic. Um, yeah. I mean, in the UK, uh, any idea what John Fox is up to? Do you? Is he still touring? Do you still see things? No. I mean, the last I heard, it was he, he's a photographer. Right. I mean, I th- he did. He, he, did, he has toured and he released a few solo albums after Ultravox because he did go yeah. solo. Yeah. Um, but that didn't go anywhere, and he kind of retired. And I can't yeah. remember what his occupation was, but it was um, it was something like a state agent or. Um, and then, yeah, he ended up being a really well-regarded photographer, I think, if I remember right. And he did, um, you know, he's done, I think he's done album covers or, like, fa- you know, reasonably p- famous things. So, yeah. yeah. And then just the, the odd gig. I think he's done, like, an evening with John Fox because he has got quite a cult following. He's done those kind of shows over the years. Yeah. Um, well, that's a, that's a shame because, like, the band is named after him, literally. And, yeah. And, um, you know, he should not be forgotten. So we need to put a spotlight on John Fox, maybe a future show, some even more stuff because he, he is a yeah. super talent. And um, look, you know, photography, I will look that up, um, I'm sure. Yeah, and he, and he was putting lyrics into this kind of music when nobody else was putting in these kind of lyrics. I mean, they were putting in lyrics, but they weren't always the most well thought, out, you know. I and mean, sometimes they had a, a wonderful spiky attitude that gave them something yeah you know, with the pistols the clash certainly yeah. became great lyricists later on joe's a wonderful writer mm. um but didn't get to show it as early as this put it that way you know yeah. joe's still singing about we had a garage band we come from garage land um you know the spanish bombs in andalusia are quite a while away aren't they yeah. Um, whereas John John Fox years earlier here comparatively is is writing novels practically for for these they're they're short stories more than more than uh, lyrics and places I think he's a wonderful writer yeah yeah well I I reckon that the a lot of the punks would have hated that because mm. they, I think they were very cynical even like a lot of the punks didn't like the Stranglers because of the mm-hmm. art school university yep. background. So I think they would have um, absolutely hated um, Ultravox and their artistic leanings because that, yeah. that's not where they come from. So, yeah. All right. So we go to 1980. So John Fox um, in the late 70s um, decides to give up the band and pursue a solo career, as Davey says. And um, this album gets put together, which is an absolute smash. And it comes on the cusp of MTV and some really wonderful movie within a movie video clips. A lot of them, I think, were directed by Russell Mul- Mulcahy. Um, yeah. And this album, Ultravox, folks, um, it's a wonderful album. And even get the Steve Wilson remixes, which came out yeah. in Record Store Day, I think, last year or not the year before. Yeah. There the- you go. It's one. Man, I've got some. Mm. Oh, uh, is that a, like a box? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is this is five CDs and a DVD. Um, wow, wonderful! So it's you get the the original analog, you get uh, the Stephen Wilson stereo mix, you get rarities, singles, B sides, and live. Then you get the cassette recordings, which are all the demos of these songs from '79. 
Um, so incl- like including instrumental versions of Private Lives, New Europeans yeah. and things. And then yeah. you get the St Albans gig, um, and that is where he's still doing Hiroshima Monomore, for example. So yeah, so this is one I was thinking of. And then um, the DVD gives you all the different versions from over the year, uh, over the years, Dolby mixes and surround 5.1 mixes, etc. So, yeah, big bog set, Steve Olsen wow. remix. And, yeah, yeah. I, I was about to say, I've got so many different versions of the album. It probably combines to that, but I don't have yeah. the, the demos. Do they sound um, sort of remotely like the finished product or is it a little bit rough yeah. and ready? Yeah, in places, um, you can hear embryonic versions. I mean, we're talking cassette versions, so they really are just hitting records, jamming, seeing yeah. what comes out. Because yeah. New Europeans, for example, started um, as a, a title, and then they wrote a song around it, and they just mm. like, this title, that sounds good, let's make a song. Yeah. Um, but yeah, other, other things like Mr. X does sound, you know, because there isn't too much musical to that, so there's nowhere really to go, you know, yeah. you can do too much different on it. Um, but yeah, Vienna is fascinating to hear Vienna in an embryonic version because how can you have Vienna stripped down? You know, you take out the grandiose Vienna, what is Vienna? Yeah. Um, so yeah, f- fascinating listen. Fantastic. I'll, I'll probably get that one day anyway. The curse is mm. real. Um, mm-hmm. All right, so we'll talk about this album. Um, just just a little bit of business end. Um, so Stevie Shears left the band as well, and you, Midger came in, and obviously he took the role of lead vocalist and actually guitarist, but you still had mm-hmm. Billy Curry, you still had Chris Cross, and you still had Warren Cam, but very much a different band. And I think this this album was influenced by what was happening in the, the club scene, um, mm-hmm. So very much uh, Visage, Steve Strange, um, fingerprints on this, uh, Gary Newman, and a lot of other influences. So um, hit us with a song, um, spotlight a song, and we'll take it from there. Yeah, I mean, it, um, as you mentioned, mid, mid-year joins, but what a, what a wonderful um, career he had just before this. Even He was only 27, and he'd already been in Slick, uh, Thin Lizzy, and he, he would still be in Thin Lizzy when he was in Ultravox, which we'll go into in a wee second. A lot of people uh, can't Rich, get their head around that, can they? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Rich they... Kids, it was, it was in the Rich Kids, and Visage, he was in Visage. Um, so, yeah, it's bizarre that he had this, am- and he wrote things like um, uh, Peril for uh, Gil Peril for Phil Linnett. Um, on that solo um, debut for Phil, um, which became the top of the pop theme tune. So, cha ching. Um, so, yeah, I mean, Midge I wrote, Do They Know It's Christmas? You know, I mean, the guy was, was phenomenally successful taking away anything Ultravox. Mm. Um, but yeah, to go to the actual um, Ultravox era itself, people did complain that um, Ultravox have sold out. You know, they've gone, they've gone way too commercial. First of all, I think that's nonsense when you listen to some of the stuff that's on this album. It is really not easy listening in places. Some of it is, but some of it is really out there. Um, and what they neglect to mention is that when John Fox left, the band had left a massive, as the, the police car goes, every time I record, I don't live in Crime City, but, you know. Uh, this just follows up uh, our train spotting episode, folks. I, know, I, know. Same, time, I, think the, I think the cop is looking for somebody still. Well, I know. It's, I think they've been looking for me every time. They've just not caught me. They just go around in circles. Um, okay. I'm here if they want me. Um, but yeah, the, um, the band were left um, with a massive amount of debt because this was the era where you were still, you were given an upfront amount by your record label. God, can you imagine that happening these days because they assumed you would be successful selling records um, and they didn't. So Midge comes in and the first thing he's told is, oh, great, you're in the band. We're in a massive amount of debt. Can you help us out with that? So Midge joins Thin Lizzy, rejoins Thin Lizzy because he's already been on the records of Black Rose, rejoins Thin Lizzy to go on a month's tour with him in the US just so he can fund studio time for Ultravox. That's how committed he is. So, you know, they owe him a mass. So when people say, like, as if mid kind of took over, and there wouldn't be an Ultravox if it wasn't for mid They would have just had crippling debt and they would have collapsed. mid saved Ultravox from, from, from losing their granny's houses, probably they were in so much debt. Um, comes in and 
knocks it out of the park straight away. Yeah, the first couple of singles were not massive hits, but then the title track pushes them over the edge and they never look back. So, I mean, you, you said let's have a look at a couple of uh, tracks. To me, I would just have to start with the title track. It is, it is to me, the ultimate Ultravox song. Um, Dancing with Tears in Their Eyes is the most successful. It's the most played um, in, in Spotify and things. But this is their masterpiece. Um, when it starts with uh, dun, 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 and it's so sparse, and Midge is doing that really unusual vocal. He's not singing like Midge really at all. He's almost singing in this kind of mumbly fashion, you know, where he's doing the um, voice freedom and a person stays with you until it's like, it's like he's trying not to move his lips almost, you know, he's trying to set a scene of, you know, and he never sings like that again. It's a, it's, it's a conscious choice to do that. Um, you know, where he's so mystic and so hmm. um, and then when the, when uh, that's an ambulance this time, so something clearly has happened. Yeah. <laughs> and it wasn't me. I've got a witness. Um, the, um, when the, the chorus comes in, yeah, it's keys, but by this point, keys had come along just enough that they could come up with something that sounded cathedral-like and epic and massive. And by God, when that comes in, when he goes, the spirit is gone, only you and I, it means nothing to me. This means nothing to me. Oh, Vienna. It's like, what? Where did that come from? I never um, get sick it, of it. I never get yeah, sick me of neither. It. Me I neither. I could hear it this a hundred be. times. Yeah. It should be. It should be one of those songs that we go, oh, come on. Come on, we've heard that. We know we can, we can sing it in our sleep. Um, but everything about it is just hook, 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 but never in a cheap way, never in a sellout mm. way. That's why that's why I don't accept this premise that they sold out. Um, I don't accept it at all. And you get that ridiculously gorgeous instrumental passage where the, the tempo completely changes and the viola and violins come in with it. Mm. Mm -hmm. Built it up. So mournful, yeah, and, and it's yeah. building and building, and then the piano comes in with one of the most yeah. gorgeous piano lines with it. Do, 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 this descending line, do, 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 yeah, cascading, do, do, do. yeah, yeah. And then when that when that reaches its, well, it's not a crescendo because it's cascading down by that point, mm. and then Midge Midge picks up at the same notes and yeah. goes, "It means nothing to me." Yeah. Oh, Vienna. It's like, Whoa, what have I just heard? This is epic, this is grand, this is sweeping, this is classical music, but made by a synth pop band essentially of this era. I agree. And it blows my mind. It is one of the greatest singles of the 1980s by anybody, I think. Well said. Um, I agree with everything you said. And it is a head scratch that that um, didn't reach number one because of my countrymen. Uh, shut up your face, Joe Dolce. Yeah. Yeah, that really. really bad, um, yeah. I know. I know the. I know the Brits love a um, a novelty song, but come on, folks. Seriously, there is a um, people always mention the Dolce. Uh, What's the matter, you? Hey, yeah. got no respect. Hey, but what what people also forget is um, it was number two for four weeks, and the first two weeks it was actually held off number one by John Lennon, who had just died, obviously. Okay, um, so. So which one? John, which Lennon, John Lennon's song was that? Was that women watching probably, the wheels? Yeah. Or? yeah, women are watching the wheels. One of the uh, look, I could, I one. could handle that, but Joe Dolce, yeah. come on. Yeah. Seriously. So yeah, you're right. So that means that the next week the public were probably so mournful over you know having to listen to Imagine over and over on the radio. They were mm. probably in the mood for some Joe Dolce. <laughs> yeah. Um, there you and, go. Um, yeah. And perhaps Vienna just didn't cut it because um, that's not a song to cheer you up, although it's a masterpiece. It's probably um, the, one of the greatest uh, number twos of all time. Um, yeah. Um, and to be honest, the fact that that didn't make number one famously is almost made it more infamous because of that. Because whenever mm. people mention the songs that didn't make it to number one, they always mention Dojo, Do Joe Dolce get Ultravox off number one with Sharp Your Face. Yeah. So it's almost like if it had made number one, it would just be another number one. But yeah. the, the fact that it was kept off is added to its legacy, you know, it's yeah. given it a kind of cool factor. Absolutely. Look, we could do a whole show on Vienna because it's, it's yeah. an enthralling um, story. 
The story behind um, the lyric, It Means Nothing to Me, was that yeah. um, Midger was getting quite frustrated in the recording mm-hmm. studio. So the um, producer was Conrad Plank, who's known for... Uh, Connie um, Plank, yeah. Um, craft work and he's, he did some work you, with... with, with yeah. yeah. Eurythmics as well. And he was getting frustrated um, with the arrangements and he said, look, this just doesn't mean anything to me. And yeah. it somehow morphed into the, the lyrics. And, and I think that's the the key part of the, the lyric. If you go to a person of my age and go up to them and say, it means nothing to me, they'll probably respond, oh, Vienna. Or yeah. yeah. I, well, <laughs> to this day, when anybody in work says, oh, we're off to Vienna for a long weekend, Instantly, that means nothing to me. You know, instantly, instantly. And everybody knows what you mean because it's it's never faded away. I don't know if the, the show ever made it across um, across to the other side of the world there, down under, but um, there was a show called Life on Mars about 15 years ago with John Sim yeah, as yes, a cop. Yeah, yes. Um, and he, he was he was a modern-day cop, is in a coma. He wakes up and it's, he's all of a sudden a cop in the 1970s. How did I get here? Yep. And the music, the, the music that plays is David Bowie's Life on mm. Mars. But then they did a sequel to that series called Ashes to Ashes, and they want to have a similar premise where um, Keely Hawes' character is a modern-day cop. She's in a car accident. She wakes up. And she's in 1980. And how did I get here? What the hell's going on? And the music they use to show her confusion of what's going on is the while she's looking around. And then it means nothing to me. While she's looking around, completely dazed and confused, wondering what it's 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 brilliant. So it's never left the pop culture. I don't think it ever will. It's it's just a seminal single. It's one of the great songs. Absolutely. And you you were you were spot on. I can remember the reviews of this album from the mm-hmm. cool press, um, like your Nick Kent's. I'm not saying necessarily Nick Kent's, but um sort of your <laughs> NME type of uh, yeah. critics were were not that favourable to this this album mm-hmm. because I think they were bunching it in the um, the teen set and yes. um, the synth pop and I, I only think it's like years later that people are going back and saying mm-hmm. this is, this was actually great music. Um, yeah. So I mean, uh, we need to pick a. We better not gush just over Vienna because yeah. <laughs> that would just be one track. Um, I mean, the fact that it opens, you know, to to suggest that this is a solo album, but it opens with a seven minute instrumental, uh, Astrodyne is just ridiculous. Solo um, albums do not open with seven minute synth instrumentals. It's brave, um, isn't it? It's brave. Yeah, it's, yes, absolutely. Um, and it's almost like they're. Uh, paying tribute to Tangerine Dream, one of their earlier influences. Um, stunning stuff. Um, you know, the idea that a sellout would, would start with this, no, no chance. Despite the fact this was very much the synth either, they wouldn't do that. But then that flows very much straight into New Europeans, which to me is the closest they sound on the album to the Fox era. I think that's, mm. so I think it's well, it's well positioned in terms of a, 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 a bridge between the two eras, if you like. Because um, I love New Europeans, like it's great, great uh, tracks, so well produced, brilliant guitar parts. The middle eight itself is, is wonderful. Um, again, the lyrics on this were done by um, on most of the album. Midge wasn't the lyricist; it would become the lyricist, but it was um, the rest of the guys. It was the drummer mostly, and um, the the the, 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 uh, the lyrics. It was Warren Can, yeah, Warren Can, um, which is just. You know, bizarre because he wasn't a writer really during the during the, the Fox era too much, and he came up with some great stuff. You know, with the on a crowded beach, washed by the sun, he puts his headphones on. His modern world revolves around the synthesizer song, full of future thoughts and thrills. His senses slip away. He's a European legacy, a culture for today. So you know, they're coming up with ideas and things that they were. Absolutely, very, very, very ahead of themselves again, um, but also of the time. That became a big hit in Japan, oddly enough. Um, really, a massive hit. Yeah, big hit in okay. Japan. It was, I think, it was used for a whiskey advert. Um, as cliched as that sounds, to be a whiskey yeah. advert in Japan. But um, yeah, I love the uh, piano lines. It's very classical. Mm. It's like Tchaikovsky. It's it's sort yeah. of um, there's there's a lot of um, baroque and classical flourishes all the way through all, and the way, maybe, all the way through the record yeah. and maybe that really did sort of roll up those sort of critics that you know they're thinking oh no the post-punk spikiness is gone they're going into this sort yeah. of 
Because when you think of the fashion of New Romantic, it was definitely for a bygone age, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and you can see Midge as a New Romantic figure. You know, he had his hair slicked back. He had the little Clark Gable moustache, didn't he, at the time, which I think he regrets having that now. It looks a bit measly, but he had it. Yeah. Um, and the music videos, uh, you know, Vienna's music video was stark black and white with Midge with a long trench coat looking, you know, awfully which, sad. Which he wore in Live Aid. Yeah. Remember, <laughs> remember the, the overcoat? They were yeah. really good in that set because um, they mm -hmm. were playing in daylight and it's in it's really hard to win over an audience in daylight. Mm -hmm. And um, they did all this material and it just came over really well with the audience. They, they really yeah. grooved on it. Yeah, and it was pretty much a last hurrah for that for 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 Midge's era. To, to, you know, mm. it was the last the last big moment for them. Sure, I mean, I guess we should also pick a couple of other tracks. Um, do you know? I'm going to say that um, I think that the run on here at the end of the album of Western Promise, Vienna, and All Stood Still is one of my favorite album runs. I love all three of those. Absolutely mm. phenomenal, over the top. Western Promise, soaked in synth. Absolutely drenched with it, even more so than most most of their output. Um, it was recorded in like a mar place around by marble, like a cathedral or something, with loads of, with loads of marble, and they had to sneak in and mm. record, and then sneak back the next night and record a bit more. And that's what gives Midge's vocals the kind of echo effect. It's not a studio effect. It was actually recorded that way, which I think is brilliant, because it, it doesn't sound like just a bit of reverb. It, it, it does sound very spooky and ethereal. Yeah, it does sound like he's singing in a church um, from a well, distance. It's, it's really when wonderful. When you've got those hard surfaces, it, the, 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 it would just yeah. bounce. Yeah. Um, and then that that last track, All Stood Still, yeah, that, that, that is a very poppy type song at places. But I think it's just so infectious. Um, when he's doing the um, when he's doing the the part about uh, what's the pre-chorus again? It's the please remember me. Mm. Oh, how does that line go again? Oh, I'm, I'm stumbling on that. See, when you're trying to think of two songs mm -hmm. at once, please remember me. In tapes you've left behind when he's doing that pre-chorus, but yeah, that, right. that's fantastic. And then we stood still. He stood still, you know. Do, 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 do. I reckon John still, Fox could have sung that song. Oh, I wrote so that down. Good. I think um, John Fox. So good. That's one of the songs that John Fox could um, have easily sung yeah. in his era, but he would have done a different take. But that's. Yeah. I know how you said one of the other tracks was very much like the early Ultravox. This one, even though it's got a lush arrangement, I, I could imagine um, the early yeah. Ultravox doing this one as well. Yeah. I mean, again, very sing along here with it. You know, you can imagine the audience. We stood still. We all stood still. Still stood still. You yeah. know, it's very, it's very easy to sing along Punk, with that. You know, sort but of again, still, still, still. You know, like yeah, that. yeah. Um, but but again, he's setting it up with a pre-chorus that is kind of gorgeous, which you don't mm. get. You know, with the please remember me. Yeah. So that's all. That is almost new romantic. So it, it's almost like they are saying we don't really care about genre. We've got bands mm. that we like, we've got sounds that we like, but we're Ultravox and we're kind of happy just doing Ultravox genre. Yeah. And I'll say it again, the viola of Billy Curry all the way through, this, yes. it, it adds this really haunting sort of mm. melancholy feel towards it. Um, mm -hmm. I want to put a shout out to Sleepwalk. I love that dream, yeah. dream, dream. Um, and yeah. I love that. It's it's sort of like a craft word on steroids. I love yeah. passing strangers and that little midsection where it goes into yeah. this little, um, this mad sequence of line. Um, yeah. So and that's maybe the most, the most obviously new wave thing on the album, passing strangers, I'd say. Like, yeah. It's clearly new wave. Yeah. But some great vocal effects on it. Um, the bass on that's fantastic as well. Yeah. Maybe you might want to talk about the uh, the recent remixes. What do you think of those compared to the originals? Just maybe put you know, a word out on that. Yeah. Um, I th maybe it's just me. Um, I, I think um, Stephen Molson is a very good uh, remixer and a very, obviously a very good mm. producer. But his stereo mix here, compared to the Analog Master of 1980, I don't think it adds much. Mm. Um, I, I think this was always such a clean and beautiful album because they wanted to go 
with this very classical approach in places. Mm. Um, you can hear that they want to show off their virtuosity. You can hear that they want to have classical piano, classical viola, not just play some fiddle and play some piano. You know, they're, they're, mm. they're wanting to show their, their actual chops. So the only way to do that is to kind of give things room to breathe. Otherwise, it would just get mm. buried. So it was never an album that really felt cluttered or anything like that. So Stephen Wilson's stereo mix isn't essential, I don't think. It's not one I'd say, oh, you must hear what he's done with this, unlike, say, his work with Jethro Tull and some of the Merillion stuff. Or, or Sabbath. So, yeah. Um, where, which where is so, where you see the difference is so evident yeah. because he, yeah. he, he brings out certain instrumentation that you've never heard. Mm. Um, but yeah. this is kind of more, maybe more uh, a subtle type of remix. Yeah, subtle is the so. word. Yeah, and yeah. I, I wonder if that's that's probably the reason why it's not had a big standalone release separately because there's just not enough to make it worthwhile. Um, yeah. Whereas you know, I think he's done wonders with Tears for Fears as well. Um, you know, he always finds things that can bring forward. And it just mm. makes the room feel a bit bigger. But just this always did to me anyway. It's such a such a wonderful, wonderfully produced record. Um, that yeah, I just don't think there's there's ever been anything wrong with the sounds of it. And even after after listening to Steve's version um, and all the different mm. versions that are on the DVD, um, yeah. and yeah, it's interesting to, to even look at the guys. You know, what what kind of scene did it look as if they're trying to fit into there? It is new wave, isn't it? Um, it is. But it's all, but it's you know it's. Yeah, it's full I mean, on. It's full on film noir. That you know the uh, the photographs. They all look very you know yeah. like on the on the back where yeah. you know all those yeah. portraits. Mm -hmm. It's sort of like a you know Jim, sort of like a nineteen forties uh, bogey. Yeah, film, you know, yeah. They're in Casablanca yeah, I mean, or something. Gene Turney's going to come out, and I don't know. Yeah. Yeah, it's like Robert Mitchum should be should be shot with colours like that, really. Um, yeah, almost. In fact, the the picture of Warren there looks like Billy Joel's The Stranger or something. Um, yeah. It's a great picture of Midge. I don't think he's got his moustache too grown in there. You can yeah. barely see it. Um, yeah, I think he needed a bit of pen or something to go over that, a bit of his uh, girlfriend's yeah. mascara or something, because his moustache was never too hot. <laughs> yeah. Um, look at, yeah, look um, at the photo of Warren, Warren Han. He looks very Japan-like. He could sort of that um, androgynous yeah. look. Yeah, and again, they took flag for that because he's wearing makeup. Um, mm. So, you know, what's, you know, they going for here? Before and Human so League, loved. folks. Before Human yeah. League. Yeah. In, in fact, Chris, Chris on that picture, do you not think Chris looks like Mark Almond? On the back of that, look at his face. Tell me that doesn't look a bit like Mark Holmes. You're right. Yeah. You're right. Two more questions before we wrap it up. So mm. what out of these two albums is your favourite? What do you, what wins if we had an album battle? It's almost unfair because um, this is, this is such a seminal album that I think um, that this is the kind of album that somebody who isn't even a particularly big Ultravox fan should just own this anyway. Mm. I think this is the kind of album that you should just have in your collection if you're a music collector. Yep. It's, it's everything that's good about 80s synth music for me, late, early 80s uh, synth music is on this record. And the ambition and the production and the playing and the addition of mid-year and how quickly he settles in and how wonderful this whole project is. You would never know this was a band struggling and him having to do side hustling and mm. everybody's taking on odd jobs and different bands doing session playing to just pay for more studio time to finish the bloody thing. Mm. Um, this to me, no, this is their masterpiece. This is their magnum opus. And that is not to decry, well, okay, I will decry this particular version because it's a piece of my finish shit. But yeah. um, in, in general, um, this album is fantastic. It's overlooked. And yeah, I'm going to say that VN is better than it, but mm. for what this is, for what this is, it's brilliant. It's absolutely brilliant. And yeah. I think there's a lot of people out there that would get a lot from this who actually wouldn't even like this. They yes. would think this was too too poppy, too, too synth heavy, whereas the, the punkiness of this, I think, would, would appeal much more. And the pre-post-punk, if that makes any sense, would appeal to them. So yeah, I'd recommend this for that kind of crowd. Well, I agree. I'm going to pick this because I've got an emotional attachment. I bought this in 90, 1980. I listened to it all the way through school. So from an emotional attachment perspective, this is the one that I picked. But I think it's a bee's whisker just above ha-ha-ha because I've 
you know, I've only heard that ha 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 last five years. And mm. you can just see the influence of that is just immense. And reading and doing a deep dive into the album to see all these artists are just so influenced by that era of Ultravox. Yeah. One final question to you, my friend. What mm -hmm. is the, how do you think Ultravox is regarded today? And what do you think they will be remembered? Um, I think they'll be remembered for Vienna as an album and a single, um, even though um, Dancing with Tears in My Eyes is still, you know, probably the most famous song. I think that will fade as, as time goes on. Um, you know, that's the kind of sappy thing that, you know, got them a lot of money, got them a lot of airplay, but it's, it doesn't have longevity. I mean, it's a good pop song for what it is, um, but it's not got the depth and it's not got the, 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 the staying power that this sh rightly should have. I think this if you, if, will be played in 50 years by, by people discovering um, British electronic music of the early 1980s and rightly so. I think that's the place when, when people are talking about um, bands in the UK who brought out Electronica, um, they have to mention Ultravox. They just have to, you know. They're, they're not the main ones because they're not a purely electronic band, um, but certainly the ones who incorporated it into other kinds of music, they must be up there in the conversation. Yeah. Well, I agree with everything you've said. I think that um, everyone will remember them, at least for that one song, Vienna, because I think that is part of pop culture, at least on the, um, the Anglo side of the world. And... Um, yeah, I, I don't think they will be forgotten because uh, their tentacles have been far too many into a lot of other bands that were influenced, um, and we've we've discussed those. Davey, thank you again. You have uh, brought, brought, brought home the bacon, as they say. Mm -hmm. um, this has been a really enjoyable, free-flowing conversation about Ultravox, and um, I'll put all your details regarding your channel. Please check out Davey's Fantastic. channel. Please like and subscribe to Rock Daydream Nation and tell us what you think of Ultravox and these two albums, which album you pre prefer or not. And guaranteed, I think we're going to do a, a, a suede show um, in the not too distant future. So we'll, we'll cover yes. that. Watch out for that, folks. Yep. Uh, I think uh, Davey's chomping at the bit to talk suede, and I'm looking forward to having a conversation about uh, some of their albums. And um, I think by the time we do that episode, you, well, I think you've already seen them, haven't you? So, I did. I saw them a couple of weeks ago. We'll leave that so, to the episodes. Yeah. yeah, fantastic. All right. Cheers. See you later.